It's on? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sid, for the introduction. So, uh, thank you for the organizer. Thank you to the organizer for inviting me. So, uh, yes, I will tell you about uh, various things related to network. So, I try to find a good title. I, I think network structure function evolution is really what describes best what I'm going to tell you about. It's not a very specific title not, uh, because I could replace this by protein structure function evolution. I would also work. But anyway, uh, that, that gives you a bit uh, an idea of the direction that I'm going to. To, 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 to lead you. So uh, I start with very general remarks to motivate a little bit the kind of uh, question I'm interested in and the kind of formalism we're going to study. And uh, this is this might be something you've already seen earlier during the talk, uh, during the week. Uh, uh, this uh, famous uh, Gedanken experiment, thought experiment by Gould uh, in his book, Wonderful Life. So uh, he asks this very simple question about evolution. Is evolution purely contingent? And, and uh, one way to answer this question is to make this thought experiment. So imagine you take our evolutionary history leading to dinosaurs and eventually ourselves. Imagine you are able to go back in time, say, to the Cambrian, you know, just after the Cambrian explosion when all the body plants uh, emerge. And then imagine you will redo evolution again. You know, you just rewind the evolutionary tape and play it back. So how life would be different uh, than what we have thought. Of course, it will be different because there is always an element of contingency, you know, like there is this meteor that kills the, the dinosaurs. Uh, so we would have a different life history, but maybe, you know, later on, there could have been another me uh, meteor coming, killing dinosaurs, and other kind of mammals that have emerged. You know, this is the kind of question he's asking. And Good is arguing that, you know, with exactly with this meteor argument, that life is very, very contingent, that you cannot really do any kind of strong prediction about what life would look like if you had to rewind the evolutionary tape and play it again. That said, you saw uh, in this school that uh, you have uh, actually many counterexamples of this statement. And uh, so yesterday, Paul Rainey uh, dis discussed uh, many of the, uh, several of them. Uh, the one I like very much is uh, the, cam the camera eye. Why do I like the camera eye? Because it's really a clear example of convergent evolution in different animals, where the last common ancestor between all these animals uh, only had a photosensitive layer of cells. And then these animals completely independently, independently evolved the same, the very similar camera eye. We should not say the same camera eye, but very, very similar camera eyes. So this is clearly an example that, you know, even though there are random elements in evolution, uh, and clearly mutations are random, and mutations are obviously the main engine of evolution, still you get some reproducibility at some level. Uh, clearly, this eye is different also from the cephalopod eye, but you have some kind of common structure that is emerging. What is interesting with this problem is that actually uh, this is a, a problem that is already in, da in Darwin's book, Origin of Pieces, and so uh, and, and you can reframe this question as in the following way, how can complex structures evolve? And so Darwin is, is, uh, is really puzzled by this question, and he, uh, there is this quote, so I'm, go as his quote, so I'm going to read it, uh, because uh, it's early in the morning. So, if numerous get gradations from a perfect and complex eye to one very imperfect and simple, each grade being useful to its processor can be shown to exist, then the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection can hardly be considered real. And so what Darwin tells us here is that to evolve something as complicated as an eye, it might not be such a problem because you might have many, many, many small incremental steps going from you know, a photosensitive layer of cell to a complex eye. And if you can understand every single of these steps, then you will understand the evolution of an eye. So in modern terms, I don't know if, if you've seen these terms uh, in, 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 this in this course, uh, this is a distinction between two modes of evolution. So the first mode is what is called microevolution. So microevolution is going to be on the short time scale what is happening. So for instance, you have an allele, you know, have different alleles in the population, or the frequencies of alleles are going to change, you know. Uh, on a relatively short time scale. This is incremental, and usually you can, you, uh, you, uh, you can build a relatively detailed theory, or at least try to build a relatively detailed theory of microevolution. So microevolution is corresponding to you know, these little steps here. Uh, this is to be contrasted, it, uh, contrasted with what is called macroevolution. So macroevolution is really more like a bird's eye view, where you have a very, very long time scale, you know, and this is, what, uh, this is the time scale where you study the emergence of very, very new new feature, new innovations, such as the eye. 
And so there are many people discussing what can happen at the macroevolution level. So you have, for instance, this theory by Good of punctuated equilibrium. Uh, it's, you can have a much more coarse-grained view of evolution. And uh, basically, my, my questions are lie really at the intersection between microevolution and macroevolution. I'm really interested in this. I want to understand how, with the simple micro changes, incremental changes, you can actually build completely new stuff, Innova you know, innovative uh, things like the eye, like an organ, things like that. And I think you know, it's a very interesting question, and, and that is mature in some way uh, to be addressed with theoretical, uh, theoretical uh, tools. Um, okay, so uh, what is interesting for the problem of the eye is that actually people have tried to do exactly, uh, uh, really do the theory of the, of the stair here that you can see, and there is a very interesting paper by Nielsen and Pager in 94 where they argued that you can essentially make a physical theory uh, of this micro to macro evolution of the eye. And the argument is, is, is quite simple. So uh, why do you want an eye? Why do you want an eye? It's because to know, you know, you have predators, you have different, different things happening, and so you want to be able to identify, uh, you know, the direction of a signal, of a light signal. And so to identify the direction of a signal, well, uh, you know, what we know from physics is that, you know, if you have an opening like this, uh, you get more accuracy if you are able to, uh, to, essentially, uh, to essentially lower the angle of the light coming to this layer of there. And what is really interesting, so that sounds like a, a, a kind of trivial thing to do, but what, what, they, what they argue is that you have two ways to do that. And this is where, this is where there is a subtlety. So imagine you have, uh, you know, imagine you have an opening like that. So then there are two things you can do to decrease the angle. You have two choices. Choice one is that you can just close the opening. So that's the choice one. Okay, and so now, so let me try to draw the angle like this. Choice one, you close the opening. Okay, and then choice two, then uh, you can basically, you know, essentially dig a pit. That's, that's, that's not very good at drawing this. But basically, you have, always, you have in this problem, you exactly have two modes of evolution. And then the question is that, you know, imagine you have a proto-eye like this, you know, and of course, this is already an advanced eye, but imagine you have a proto-eye like that. Uh, the question you can ask uh, which, 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 uh, which mode of evolution are you going to choose based on some considerations such as, you know, the cost of uh, changing uh, the opening or the cost of, of, of being the eye. And so uh, they make a quantitative argument for this. I'm not going to, to really detail it very much, but what they argue is that you have a very, you know, with very general consideration, there is a very clear evolutionary pathway from the associative layer uh, of cell to an actual camera eye. And so this movie I'm going to show you now is illustrating the, the pathway that they predict. Uh, yes? Okay, uh, can I stop the movie? <laughs> I should stop the movie then. Is it stopped? No? Okay. Ah! Okay, good. Yes, <laughs> please. Do you mean uh, reduction in the field of vision also in this case? Sorry? Reduction in the field of vision. The field of vision is what? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. No, because you have you always have light coming from all directions. Yeah, you could argue. No, you even have light coming, you know, incidentally like that. But I guess they don't. Yeah, I don't think this is a big deal anywhere. No, they just you know they focus on the angle. They just focus on the angle. They're not saying anything about the field of vision or anything like that. Uh, but I guess, you know, you always have some, you know, essentially, even if you start with the fossil CV layer, so you always have light coming from that direction. Of course, you will have less intensity, but they are really more interested in accuracy. And so this is the angle. Okay? Yes? A photosensitive cell, is that a cell or like is it a miniature eye or something? Or, I mean... uh, like here, is it a cell? Yeah, yeah, so you assume, so this is known from biology that, you know, the common ancestor of all animals with camera eye, they had light sensitive cells. So this means that, you know, light is coming, they emit some signal. So, and some neural signal, basically. So they start with this hypothesis. Okay. So uh, now I'm going to show you the movie. And so basically what they show in this paper, what they argue in this paper, is that uh, you have, you start first by making the cavity. 
instead of restricting the openings, that makes sense. You know, if you start to restrict an opening that is not existing, you won't get much. So you start with this, and then at some point you have a hemispherical eye like this, and then when you have a hemispherical eye like this, which looks like the fish eyes basically, then it's it's it start, it's you start having you know uh, more. Uh, restriction of the opening until uh, until the point where you really have something that looks more like uh, uh, our eyes, that's, uh, you know, our own eyes. And then in the end, of course, well, you can evolve a lens or something like that. You know. Anyway, so I, I, I don't want to go too much into the detail of this paper, but I think it's an interesting example. Is it working? Okay, I, I have some feedback now. That's working. Uh, it, it's an interesting uh, example of. Um, how you could try to build a physical or quantitative theory uh, for evolution and for macroevolution of a new uh, of a new organs. And so uh, I think there are two lessons from that: uh, that uh, you know you can compute a path, but it's clearly not a straight line. You know you have first you know a direction, and you go in one direction, and then you fork in another direction. Uh, of course, this is a prediction. That means that if you are Go back and look at the evolutionary history. You should see this, you know, this first direction and then this forking. And they argue in their paper that they see that in the fossil record. And then uh, you need to do that. You really need a quantitative theory for pretty much everything. So you need you need a quantitative theory first for the function, the biological function you're interested in. And this notion of biological function is very important in everything I will tell you uh, during the next three, uh, in the next uh, three days. Uh, I'm really focusing on you know how do you build a functional, how do you evolve a functional uh, network, as we will see. Uh, and also, you need uh, you need a quantitative theory for how you're going to change uh, this uh, this object, this physical object that are evolving. And the last point I want to make is that the theory that you're going to consider uh, in this, uh, could be possibly emergent. And by emergent, I mean they might be specific to the scale that you're studying. So, for instance, for the eye, you see there is no. So, I'm not. Uh, it's not population genetics. It's not. Uh, it's not uh, gene networks. It's really a physical theory of the evolution of the eye based on general considerations such as you can change the shape of the eye. Okay. So. Uh, now, uh, I, now uh, this is, you know, to give you a very, very uh, over, brief overview of you know, where I'm going to, where I'm heading, and uh, now I'm going to put back the genes. And so to put back, to put back, put back the genes, uh, I, I just, you know, of course, these are reminders. Uh, what, you know, what is coming from, uh, you know, why do we, uh, do we consider the genes? Well, it's because uh, it's because it's the way it is, but uh, you know, very, very the way we think about uh, biology these days were really, you know, first uh, laid off by uh, people, uh, people such as Francis Crick, who proposed what the so-called central dogma. And so, the central dogma is that the gene uh, is containing the information, the genetic information. The gene is transcribed into RNA, and then the RNA is translated into into proteins. So that's the central dogma. And so then uh, later on, people realized, of course, that these proteins are not, you know, passive agents. These proteins can regulate other genes. And so, for instance, uh, if you have a transcription factors, it can bind to other DNA pieces uh, upstream of other genes. And then, based on this interaction, it could turn on or turn off other genes. Okay, and so then, uh, with genes regulating all the genes, you start having more complicated objects emerging, such as these so-called gene regulatory networks. And so this is what I call 21st century biology, because also, you know, this is, this is possible now to draw these maps of genetic interaction, thanks to very recent progress in, uh, I mean, recent, uh, not that recent anymore, but you know, the last 25, 30 years, people made much progress into identifying how these proteins and uh, talk to each other and how they interact with DNA. And so, for instance, this is uh, so you see it's a, it's a pretty old map. I mean, it's it's, it's, um, it's ten, more than 10, year old, 10 years old now. But this is a map of genetic interaction occurring uh, during um, urchin development. Okay, and so each of these little arrow here is a gene, and so each uh, you know this complicated. Uh, lines are interactions between these genes. And so, uh, while well, you start seeing both, where we, we, you start seeing with these maps where we are heading, so uh, the first thing is that uh, this looks like, uh, you know, a map of electric circuit or something like that. And so this is an analogy we're going to use uh, very often, you know, how can you 
you know, is there any logical analogy? Is there any uh, artificial uh, uh, human um, uh, analogy that we can use uh, to, to understand these genetic networks? And the other thing that you see is that it's obviously very, very complicated. And, uh, and so this is another example of network that is very, very complicated. So the reason why I put it forward is because we will come back to this network uh, later during the week. Uh, this is a network for a uh, biochemical network for immune recognition. And we'll define uh, what I mean by immune recognition uh, by there, probably. Uh, so this is a map done by my, my collaborator and friend, and friend uh, Grégoire Altambonnet. And so each of these nodes here is a biochemical species. Each of these link is uh, an interaction, and it's actually it's not the, even the whole network. And this is the whole network. And so you clearly see that we, we you know, I, the reason why I introduced the genes, maybe I, I was not explicit on that, is because you know we need a formalism to understand evolution, and the, the gene scale might seem like the right the right scale to do, and the formalism to understand evolution. Uh, might be related to these gene, gene networks, but then you see immediately that you are heading into trouble because these networks are super complicated. And, and so this is a problem that people, of course, have realized, and I think the, the person who is phrasing it the best is Jeremy Kunawardena in a paper from four years ago, where he said, well, you know, one of the big problems as theorists is to essentially distinguish how what he calls the biological wood emerges from the molecular tree. And so this is really the question that I'm myself interested in, and I will, I will, I will spend the next three days in, in, in my lectures to, to try to give you a sense of how, how to solve this problem. Okay, so uh, that leads me to the outline of, uh, so these were like kind of very general introductory remarks, and here is the outline of uh, what I will be telling you about uh, the next three days. So uh, I will start with, uh, you know, essentially introducing uh, what I mean by networks, and we'll focus on uh, the so-called network motifs, and uh, we spend some time looking at some small motive, especially today, and seeing what are the possible dynamics. So it's a very reductionist approach, but for good reason. I'm going to justify the reductionist approach for networks. And then once we've done this kind of preliminary, uh, preliminary um, study, uh, we'll move to connecting network to function and to evolution. And so uh, I, will, uh, I will introduce you to what I call the inverse problems for biology. So essentially the question is that given a biological functions, what kind of networks can, can do this function and how can they evolve to do this function? So it's essentially it's very similar to uh, the I problem, but we, in a network context. And so of course this is related to this uh, huge field of evolution called EvoDevo. And this is a field I'm very interested in and I will show you a couple of results we obtained uh, on EvoDevo. And then uh, my last lecture, or maybe my last lecture and a half, depending on time, I will focus on a completely different problem, uh, which is the immune uh, recognition networks. And, and so, um, the, the main interest of this, I mean, one of the main interests of this is that we could actually get experimental prediction and, and relate our theoretical works to experimental observation. And so uh, I guess the two common themes of everything I will tell you about are right, written here. Uh, in some way, what I'm interested in are biological computation. You know, it's really thinking about the cell as an information processing device. So, for instance, an immune recognition network is going to recognize uh, a foreign agent, a foreign, a foreign um, ligand, say. And the important thing also is that they evolve. Obviously, the networks in our body evolve. So you need to, if you want to understand the way they compute things, you might want to give an evolutionary angle uh, to understand how they can, as they could appear and maybe, and why, you know, maybe some more complicated networks might not be able to, to evolve. And the second common theme is that, well, I told, I, as I showed you, these networks can be very, very complicated. But then, 
uh, to solve that, you might need a bit of coarse graining. And so uh, I, will, I will detail a little bit this. You know, you need to coarse grain both the networks themselves and the function that they perform. And you always need to you know, keep in mind uh, that these things might be more completed than the coarse graining version and see how you can you know, go from one to the other. So uh, I'm not going to solve all these problems in four days because it's a very, you know, I think it's a very, very important questions and I'm not claiming that I'm, 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 I have solved them. I don't think I have solved them, but at least we found some directions and uh, hopefully uh, I will convince you that these are interesting questions and are, that are amenable to, uh, to uh, work uh, on, the, on the theory side. Okay, so uh, I still have a couple of slides. I'm not going to move to the blackboard yet, but uh, yeah, it's a good time for questions. Yes. Yes, related to the genetic networks that you showed us, may you tell us a little bit of how do you manage to get such information? To get the networks themselves? Yes. Um, I mean, it's, it's, bas it's very dependent on what you're, what you're studying. So, um, for instance, for this uh, network that I showed you, uh, it's, it's really biochemistry. So it's really like uh, identifying which kinase acts on it, which substrates. It's, it's mostly biochemistry. So, uh, and then to do that, you know, you, you, you have uh, various ways to do, to do this. I mean, either you produce mutants, uh, proteins, or you, you just, you know, put the thing in a test tube and check that this is doing the, the biochemical reaction. Uh, this is doing so that's for biochemistry now for uh in network of you know transcription you know, say transcription networks uh you know uh, there are many different uh, methods that have been developed over the years so for instance uh one thing you could do is that you could just uh, identify which part of the dna are bound by which transcription factors so you can do that in a quite systematic way uh you can do uh, very similar, you know, there you have, you have techniques that are constantly developed to identify, say, how two proteins can interact with each other, so things like called two hybrids. And so all of this is pretty sophisticated and clever uh, biochemistry most of the time to really build these maps. So there is no single answer to your question, and these techniques are always evolving in time. So I, c I could give you more re references on that, but my own references are probably not up to date. You know, these things are constantly evolving, actually. Yes? Uh, I mean uh, both. I mean uh, both optimization of parameters and then change of topologies of the network. And, and by and large, I'm, I, I think I'm actually more interested in the change of network topologies. Uh, so I, I give you specific examples later during my lectures. Okay, any other question? Okay, so, um, so today, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, introduction of you know, the notion of networks and in particular network motifs. And so um, I start with a, uh, with a network, um, with, with a net one of the, uh, uh, an actual real life network. So this is uh, the E. coli transcription network. So each of these uh, nodes here is uh, a transcription factor. And each of these uh, link here is a connection between uh, different transcription factors. And so uh, you see, you see the, the, there is a different uh, color scheme. And so uh, I should mention, uh, no, this is not my work. This is work from uh, for very nice work from the early 2000s by the team of Uri Alon. Okay. And so, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, this is where I studied, this is when I did my PhD, by the way, so that's really what drove me into this field. And, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, these people re uh, really published very influential works about network structure, network dynamics, and, and uh, this is one of their, er their early papers where they really studied uh, the, the transcription network of E. coli. So, um, I mean, just visually, you see these networks. I mean, I told you networks are very messy and stuff like that, but, but this network is, might not be so messy. You really see it, it doesn't look like a random network. Clearly, it clearly is not a random network. You, you know, it's not a random network. It's, it's kind of layered, as you can see. Uh, you have relatively few links compared to uh, the number of nodes, actually. You basically have, uh, so 
I don't have the exact figures, but you have here around 400 transform factors. And you have something like 500 connections. Okay? So, yeah, yeah, they include target genes here. Yeah, so, so they really, so the genes that, they consider 400 TFs, but they can, you're right, they can, they can influence target genes, okay? And, and so, yeah, so you really see this, uh, this, this doesn't look like a random network. I mean, I did not try to, to, uh, to generate a random network uh, with 400 links and uh, 400 nodes and 500 links, but it's clearly not a random network. So what these people did, actually, is that they, 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 they found a nice way to quantify how this is not a random network. And uh, this is the idea that led to the notion of motif. And this is actually uh, in, uh, depicted uh, in this slide and in later paper uh, the same year in science. The idea to try to start you know, getting a sense of how this network wo wo are working is to identify if there are motifs that are present in the network that should not be. And by, by, by should not be, it means that, no, imagine you take a random network with the same number of nodes and the same number of links, then you can completely randomize the connection of the network, and then you, try to, you could try to see how many given motifs are, are of one type are in this random network, and then if you see many, many more motifs in the real network compared to the randomized network, this means probably that this motif has a functional role and it evolves specifically to perform something interesting biologically. So this is a kind of topological approach of these networks, but uh, I think it yields very, very interesting results. And, and, and so we're going to start by actually today reviewing a couple of these motifs and then studying their, their dynamics. Okay? So, I'm done with, yes? Yeah. No, I'm just, no, at this stage, no. I'm just telling, I'm just introducing what people did in a historical way. And then uh, I'm, I will show you interesting motifs because I think they would be relevant for biological functions. No, I, I agree with that. The topology does not mean, I, that's part of the thing I wanted to discuss. But, but as a start, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just going to, introduce a couple of motifs. No, it's not completely unrelated. You know, I, you, know you, you could have the two extreme view, which is topology is function, and topology is not at all function. I think the truth is a bit in the, in the middle. Where in the middle, I don't know exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, we can talk about that later. I think most of the time the large network can actually be reduced to very small ones. And so it doesn't mean, you know, the fact that you have a large network could be a pure evolutionary contingency that makes you know, something proliferating for some reason, but, but the core function might be captured by very small networks. Uh, so I come back to that later, but I'm very much on the line that, I mean, that's my personal opinion now, uh, that uh, many of these networks can be really, uh, be assessed with a kind of low dimension uh, approach, and so you might not need all the complexity that you see. The reason why you have complexity, we can discuss about that as well. It could come from you know lack of biochemical specificity or stuff like that. But but we keep that. I think the immune example I will I will tell you about later on Friday is a good example where we can address this question. Yes. Uh, it's not a clique in this, okay, I'm not sure what you mean by clique. Clique would be like a cluster of genes more connected to the other genes. Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, it's not, okay, I'm not 100% sure of what clique means. What I really mean is motif, motif really, here motif is that something, and, uh, connections between nodes that are overrepresented in the real network compared to randomized networks. This is really the, the and so, 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 for instance, you can look at motifs of different sites. You can look at one gene motifs. And we're going to start with one gene motifs, and two gene motifs, three gene motifs. So, so number of, the number of, of genes or the connectivity of the gene 
the average quantity of the gene with each other does not matter. What matters is, uh, is it overrepresented in the real network compared to the randomized network? Okay? Yes? Okay, uh, honestly, this is, this is, so this, this figure is from a paper that is more general than the networks. It's about, you know, network, ecological network, food network. So I actually don't remember what the dashed line is. It's just to illustrate the idea of looking at randomized versus real network. In this, in this, in this picture, you see actually the, 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 there is a, a color code. So, uh, you have a blue lines for positive regulation and a red line for negative regulation. Okay. So actually, it's, uh, so it's a, it's a good slide to, to start studying the first motif I want to tell you about. And so, I mean, you immediately see from that what you see here. So look, for instance, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. These are genes that are regulating themselves. So this is the most simple, the simplest motif you can build in this network is a motif of, of self-regulating gene. And so, if you look at E. coli, so this, this map, actually what you get, you get 40 self-regulating genes. Okay, so quick uh, calculation, you know, it's, uh, it's just to, to wake us out. So imagine I have 400 TS on 500 connections. How many of these self-regulating motifs should I expect from a pure random you know, if, if the network of pretty random, how many of self-regulating genes should I expect, roughly? Quick calculation. Shall we vote? No, oh, any, any? You see? Yes, there are 400 nodes. Now, imagine I take a network, 400 nodes and 500, I mean, let's say 400 connections. 400 nodes, 400 connections. How many, and then I randomize the links, you know, I say I have a uniform probability to connect uh, nodes between two nodes. Uh, how many, how many self-regulating motifs do I expect? So how many, so you know, what I mean is that I have a network like this, okay? I'm connecting nodes like that, and how many, you know, some, no, some nodes are going to do that. So how many of these motifs are we, are we so I, I, maybe I put an arrow just to help you visualize. Uh -huh. So how many, roughly how many, you know, I, do I expect, do I expect at least not 400? So how, how many, how many do I expect? Yeah, okay, so somebody got the answer in the back, yes? So should we vote? No, 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 I guess, I guess we can vote because actually it's not, it's not much. So it's basically you expect only one. Because, you know, it, if I, you know, imagine one node here, you know, then you, you choose its, its successor, you know, on average it's going to have one connection because you have as many connections as nodes, so on average it's going to have one connection. And so then for one node like this, it's, it can be connected to essentially with equal priority to any other genes in the network, okay? And so it has basically one over 400 chance to be connected to a given node. And so to be connected to itself, it's basically, it's basically uh, one under 400 times, four, okay, so number, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very, uh, I'm not very clear, but the number of, so it's, if it has a probability of one over 400 to be connected to any other node, it means that the nodes connected to themselves are, you know, 400 times one over 400, which means there's only one node connected to itself on average in a random, random network. So the fact that you see 40 self-regulated genes, you know, it's a huge overrepresentation of genes that are regulating themselves compared to what would happen in a, in a, in a, in a random network because it's basically 10% of the genes. So that's why it's an important motif to study. And so clearly it comes with, in two flavors. It comes with the auto-activation flavor and then the auto-repression flavor. So uh, we're going to study uh, now how, you know, what is the difference between these motifs and what they can do. Okay. Yes? Okay, so it's, it's a very good question. So this is what is known and there are things we don't know. Okay, uh, so in 2002, so I don't know what is the exact update in terms of number genes of number connection, but I don't think it's significantly different. You know, already at that time we identified, you know, enough of the TFs and enough of the connection to be sure that this is not overtly uh, unrealistic in terms of network connection. Uh, the thing you might consider, and I will tell a word about that later, is that of course there are many more connection 
than only transcription or interaction. So for instance, what can happen is that transcription factors could form dimers. And obviously, you don't see the dimers here. So maybe this is a kind of projection on the map of uh, transcriptional interactions of some much more complete network. So when we consider these modules, we should bear that in mind that there are other interactions that are not depicted here that can have also a, a biochemical role. And so we might fool ourselves by you know, just focusing on, on transcriptions. Uh, so this is an issue. Uh, I will come back to this issue later because uh, people have started studying also what happens when you add things like protein-protein interaction and stuff like that. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm basically done with the slides. So everything else today is going to be on the blackboard. So we can, I don't know if we can get rid of that. <laughs> and and now I move uh, on, the, on the blackboard. Okay, so okay, so uh, so today the plan is to study. Uh, study the dynamics of self regulating genes. Circulating gene. And so uh, there are two reasons why we do that. The first reason is because, uh, as I just showed, the self-regulating motif is overrepresented in actual biological networks such as the E. coli network. Uh, the second reason is that, well, actually there are more than two reasons. The second reason is that's going to uh, be a very good way to introduce the kind of formalism that people use in gene network modeling that you might not be all familiar with. Although I'm aware you had a class with uh, John Reinis last, last week, and so he probably introduced some of this uh, formalism, but you know, at best it would be a, could, could be a useful reminder anyway. And the third reason is that even with, uh, argu you know, arguably the self-regulated gene is, is clearly the simplest network you can imagine. You know, it's just one node, one, one link. So it's a super simple network. But you, are, you will see that already at this level, you can have very rich dynamical behaviors that are appearing. And so understanding this kind of basic uh, dynamical behavior, I think is, is quite useful uh, even for the simple thing. So, um, <coughs> so um, the self-regulating genes can come in two flavor. It could be either, you know, an, Auto activation, or you know, a gene that is self auto auto repress, uh, self repressing. So, when I use an arrow, usually I mean a positive regulation. When I use a T, it means a negative regulation. Okay. Uh, so these are standard notations in the field. So now, how do you formalize this? How, how do I formalize this? So, um, so I'm going to use a, a very standard uh, a standard formalism, which is based on mass action law. section laws, I should say. And so I'm going to assume that, so we're going to consider a gene X. So let's, let's call uh, a gene, let's call it gene X. Okay, and so uh, I'm going to neglect many things. I'm going to neglect, uh, you know, essentially, uh, or maybe more than neglect, I should say, I'm going to condense transcription and translation into one step. Into one step. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to use, so I know you, you saw uh, stochastic formalism. I'm not going to do anything stochastic at this stage. I'm just going to uh, study, for instance, the dynamics of a system using differential equations. So I'm going to look at the time evolution of the number of the concentration of protein X in a cell. And so usually what you do is that you're going to have, uh, maybe let's call that rho of X, minus uh, delta x. Okay, so that's the standard formalism that you're going to use in this kind of, in this kind of, um, 
of problem. And so rho of x is going to be the production rate of x. Okay, and then uh, this term here is going to be the degradation. Okay, and so in kind of problems, this is the simplest thing you can do is to assume that you have a linear degradation, which means that each of the proteins have an equal probability to be degraded, and this probability is uh, basically proportional to delta. Okay, so this is the kind of formalism I'm going to study. And so now what is the difference between a, a gene that is self-activating versus a gene that is self-repressing? What is going to be uh, in the functional form of this row of X? Yes? The delta is a delta function, or is it like? No, no, no. Sorry, uh, sorry about that. I've been clear. Delta is a parameter. It's delta is delta is the degradation rate. Sa thanks very much for asking this question, <laughs> because uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm. It's very important. It's not at all a delta function. It's really, it's really a linear degradation rate. I just call it delta-like degradation. Okay. Thank. Delta, the dimensionality is one over time. Degradation, right? Yeah. Delta times x should be a rate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see what you mean. Uh, let's say let's create a production term then. Okay. Just to just to be. It's not a rate in the sense of, of uh, it's of uh, a rate per protein a production term. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so with, so now the question, is, uh, as I told you, the difference between activation or repression is going to be uh, the form of this row. And so uh, I could just give you uh, the standard form of the row that people are usually using, or, or give you a semi, uh, you know, a kind of semi-rational reason why we we we're using this function. And so. Uh, I actually, actually do both, probably. So rho of x, uh, rho of x, usually uh, in this context, you're going to assume, so it depends only on x here, so it depends on several variables. You can, uh, we, there are different things you can do, but we're going to assume that rho of x is what is called a Hill function. So you probably saw that with John Reinitz, or maybe not actually. Did you see the Hill function with John Reinitz? No? Okay. So, uh, no. So rough X, so you have two, it can come with two flavors. So for activation, rough X is going to take a form of, you know, maybe, a, let's call it beta, which is which is going to be my maximum production rate, and we're going to well, this like this. Okay, and so for repression, row of x is going to look like something like this. Okay, and in both cases, x zero is a parameter. Okay, so actually there are two parameters. There are three parameters in this uh, in these functions. So beta is going to be the maximum possible possible uh, production. Okay, x zero. This is going to be uh, uh, the 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 number of x or the concentration or concentration for uh, half activity, half production. So this is the parameter that you choose. And then n is called a uh, Hill coefficient. So uh, now I should probably plot what this thing look like because they might look very complicated, but they're, they're really not complicated at all. So for activation, 
So activating bin function. So if I look at row of x as a function of x, so then you define x0, and then you define beta. OK, and so you basically get something like that. OK, and so here you get beta over 2. So this is our infamous sigmoid function. That is that this, you, pro you saw it with John Rainey. It's a sigmoid order. He probably introduced a t hyperbolic tangent in his paper. So, and you see basically, you know, below x0 is very small, above x0 it's essentially maximum, and then you have this region where it's very, very sharply transitioned from a low to the high activity. And then for repressing hill function, it's basically this, this, this repressing hill function. It will look like this, okay? Rho of x, x, okay, so that x zero is here, beta, and then over two. Okay, so that's basically what it is. I hope I is it okay for I I I, I hope I'm not uh, boring you. I just wanted to remind you of these things because it's important. Is it okay? Okay, so. Um, and so, and this, and you can rationalize where this comes from from biochemistry. So, for instance, uh, you know, a way to model this is to say that. So, for instance, for the active function, you could say, well, I have DNA plus uh, N X, you know, and they bind into a complex, you know, X X X X DNA. Okay, where you have N times this. And then if you write a standard mass action law model for this, you will find exactly that the production, the, 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 the amount of DNA bound to the X on average is going to be exactly equal to rho of X. I'm not detailing this because it's very, it's very straightforward, but you can really rationalize where they come from. Okay, a question? Is, is there anything unclear? Yes? Mass action law? The special variation of concentration. Because okay, so that's a good. The so question is why do mass action law is essentially uh, assuming a, a mixed, well mixed system and does not account for special concentration? Uh, because it's basically an assumption and that we make to simplify calculation. It's kind of a self a self consistent. It's just what you do on on usual. You assume that this is well mixed. You're right. In a real system, you might have. You might have uh, special effects, but uh, you know these things like so he activating hill function. They are kind of realistic. Like right? people have tested experimentally, you increase the concentration of the transcription factor, and you monitor the activity of the transcribed gene, and you get something like the hill function. Yeah, it's, it's self-consistent. Here I'm going to assume it's basically a well-mixed formalism. It's really like the cell is a bag of chemicals, the chemicals interact and are well-mixed and all of that, which is a very wrong assumption for some cases, but for these cases I'm going, we're going to study together, it's not bad. Okay? Yes? Uh, um, can you go a little more in detail? When you write DNA plus okay. NX, okay, I what, detail that. Why, why, why does it give the... the yes, please, please. Um, yeah. Kind of the mechanistic... Where is this coming from? You know. Okay, mechanistically. Okay, so mechanistically, the way it's going to work is that so you have, uh, okay, you have uh, DNA, okay, and then you will have. Uh, let me let me draw it. It'll be easier. So this is my strain of DNA, and then I have my uh, genes are starting here, and this is a region that is going to be, this is a gene, this is a region that is going to be trans transcribed. Okay, and so what happened that upstream of this region, so you have, uh, you have some base pair, and so what happened that this, so in this context, X can come, you know, and then can bind to the DNA, and so several of the X can come at the same time, 
bind to the DNA. Okay, so very no. Is Sorry, so, to the so your, that X is not your gene X. Okay, so here, since I'm doing self regulation, it is a gene X, but in principle, it could be another gene. Okay. So if it's confusing, let's say it's a different gene. Let's say it's a regulator, let's call it R. Okay? <laughs> you know, I hope so, it's less confusing. So it's another R, R regulates prescription. So it's actually the protein which is yeah. So protein is coming it's from from the gene, right? No, no, so so okay. I mean, the way I understood it is that that long bar is your genome. So this is a piece of DNA where uh, that is encoding the sequence for a protein. Let's call it P. Let's forget about X because X I only had one X so far. But let's let's say let's assume you have two genes. So P is the DNA encoding for the, uh, so this piece is, this, this is a piece of the DNA encoding for the sequence of protein P. And then another regulator R is regulating the transcription of P. So there will be something here like R activates, say, P. Okay? And so biochemically what happens is that the, the proteins R are going to, are coming, binding the DNA. And so as they bind the DNA, they modify uh, they modify the way this, this DNA is transcribed. So, for instance, they could recruit the RNA polymerase, so increase the transcription rate of P, or conversely, they could prevent the RNA polymerase to come, so that gene P that would be translated, transcribed first, is no longer transcribed. And so now, if you write, you know, if you write a mass action, a mass action law equivalent of this, you will find that the rate of transcription of P is going to be a hill function of the quotient of R, assuming everything is well mixed and all of that. Okay? Yeah, so, so I guess that I now know where my confusion is coming from. So gene X is a part of the genome, right? Of the, of the DNA. So, so now, I, my, my question is, what you're modeling here is not the gene, but the protein. A, yeah. You're right. It's a, it's a, you're right. I'm modeling here. Uh, completely right. I'm modeling. I'm modeling here the construction of the protein or the amount of protein that is present in the cell. So the number of proteins. Say, you could totally right. I was. It was not completely explicit. It's this x is the number of protein in the cell. Okay. Is it clear for everybody? So so then, I I, I you know. Following the central dogma, I somehow assimilate the gene to the proteins, but you're right, in terms of biochemistry, this is a difference. You have the DNA and you have the protein. Here, this is the equation for the number of proteins in the cell. Thank you for your questions. Okay, yes? Okay, so, well, if R and P are independent, you know, you know, it could be P, if you increase PR, say you're going to have more P, if R is activating P, but then it's going to, you know, it just depends on the network itself. So to see what happens now, let's focus on the self-regulating genes to get a much a more interesting functional understanding of this specific network. But then, of course, this can be integrated in any kind of network and you have many different possible dynamics. Okay, so now let's let's move on, uh, let's do this, this case where the gene is, is Auto act, it's self-activating. So let's look at this case. And so, uh, why is it an interesting case? Well, it, it, it's, it's going to display uh, what is called by stability, very much like what Jeff Core discussed yesterday. And so, to see that, I'm going to rewrite the equation and show you graphically what happens. So now, this is our X, this is the same gene X, it's activating itself, okay? Okay, so it's activating, okay? And so now, let's, let's look at an equation of the form dx over dt is equals to beta x to the power n over x zero to the power n plus x to the power n minus delta x, okay? And so what I'm going to do to illustrate what happens, I'm going to, to basically draw these two terms, so this is my production term, so row of x, I call that row, so production. And this term is going to be degradation. Okay. Okay, and so now let's look at these two term as a function of x. So my production term is going to look like that. 
is my production. And then my degradation term, it's linear in X. And so you see immediately graphically that you're going to have three interesting, I mean, you have three cases. So if delta is big and is, uh, is, uh, is very small, you know, or actually two cases here. Yeah, you only have two cases. So if there is very small, you get something like this. Or it's small enough. So this is my production. This is my degradation. Okay, and so you see that uh, there are interestingly three intersection points with the production term. So there is three intersection points here. I'm drawing them like this, and I explain why in one second. So this is small degradation. Or if you have a big degradation, it's going to be like this. This is big degradation. Okay. And so uh, now why did I write the intersection point? Because the intersection point are the points for which the production compensates exactly the degradation. So this is a stable state of your system. So if you write dx over dt is equal to zero, this is a steady state. Okay. And so now uh, you have, I mean, the kind of, the degradation is small enough. You have clearly three steady states. And now what is interesting is that you can look at the stability of the steady state. So, and to do that, well, it's pretty easy because you have a production and a degradation term. So the only thing you need, you need to do is to see if the production is higher than the degradation or if the degradation is higher than the production, it will tell you where you go in phase space. And I will tell you immediately uh, what is the stability of the system. So for instance, in here, in this region, you have the production is higher than the degradation. So that means that in this region of X, you go in this direction. Okay, so maybe I can extend. Okay. So you can extend here. So now in this region, so degradation is higher than the production, so you go there. So this means that here, this point here, you see you go from both sides, so it's a stable steady state. Okay, this guy, so we go away from here. On this side, the degradation is higher than the production. So you go in this direction, so that means that this guy is unstable, and this guy is stable. Okay. So you see that this system has very naturally two fixed points. And so this is the, the bi-stability that already uh, also that was discussed by Jeff Gore, but it's a completely different context. So it's bi-stability. So that's the main, that's the first interesting dynamics of the self-regulating genes, and that's actually one of the main, uh, main interesting uh, dynamics is that these self-regulating genes can be bi-stable. So it can, it can, exist, the, the X, X proteins can, can, the system can exist in two configurations, a high configuration where the gene is essentially transcribed, sustaining its own transcription, so it stays high. So this is this steady state. Or if you don't have enough X, no, the X is not able to transcribe itself, and so it's, go, it's going to be wiped out from the system and completely disappear. So there are two states one active, one active state, one active state, and then one inactive state, one off state. Okay. So uh, that's a very simple formalism, very simple model. So now, of course, you can wonder why, you know, is there any biological evidence that this simple motif of self-regulation is actually working like this and can define different states? And so, uh, of course, if I mention this, it's because there are evidence that this is working. And so, in particular, a context where this is working very well and where this, is, this has been very important is a context of cellular differentiation.
So uh, in the differentiation, there is a notion that exists that is called the notion of the master selector gene. Okay, and so what is a master selector gene? This is a gene that if that is essentially associated to one cellular fate. So there's an equivalent between the pre constant presence of a gene or protein and a cellular fate. So it's, it's really equivalent. So it's cell fate is essentially equivalent to, uh, to the presence, sustained presence So it's the expression, I should say. Okay. So now I'm going to give you actual examples of this. And so this is from the biological literature. So there is a very good review where some of these cases are discussed by Oliver Albert. So this is a PNS paper in 2008. Okay, and so Oliver Robert is a specialist of, uh, yes? How the system is moving ahead if you, init if you initialize in a given concentration? Is it a question? Not sure. If the rate of degradation is greater than the production rate, so they'll be here. In this region? Okay, so in this region, if you start here, degradation is higher than production rate, so you just move back here and then you reach a zero steady state. Yeah, it stays there, it's a stable state. Well, wait, once you're there, you're locked in a stable state. So the only way for you to, to move from there is that if you have, say, a pulse of X coming from somewhere else, so that they move you back here, and then you will move to this high steady state. Yeah, there will be another, you're right, there will be the need to have uh, something else coming, expressing X in a different way. You will need another regulator that's not including in the self in the, in the, in the, in the self regulating gene. So you're right, especially in this differentiation context, you need something else that is another regulator somewhere, you know, that is coming, transcribe, transcribing X and then disappearing, but then the X here will, 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 will do the, the job to sustain the production of the gene, to have it expressed. We'll see an example tomorrow. It's self-sustained at steady state, in, basically, uh, and you know, you know, it's still a valid module. It's I I, I don't I you know it's it's a sub module. Remember, this is a sub motif of a bigger network. So you could imagine that you know there would be x is like this, but then you could have a g that is like that, and so this g here is not explicitly accounted for in the in the in this net is this motif here, but here I'm really focusing on this motif. Okay. Thank you. So. Uh Yes. Um, like going further in that point, you could imagine going backwards in your network yeah. to a to an original yeah. regulator. Yeah. Is that is this the master selector gene? No, the master selector gene would be more like at the end of the network to lock your cell fate into a, uh, to lock your fate your cell into a given fate. So it would be so, so it, sometimes it's actually called terminal selector gene. So it's really like the cells are differentiating. So in the beginning, you would have, so you're right, you could you have, you know, some kind of crazy cascade of other genes, you know, and then would you start with, uh, say, OCT4 or SOX2, uh, which are our famous uh, reprogramming uh, uh, factors for stem cells. So you start there, and then you would, uh, with these guys would trigger some differentiation networks, and at the very end, there's a guy that is turned on sustaining itself and defining what the fate is. So, so, so this is really, a, and, and then the important thing 
here is that once this gene is expressed, it stays expressed, so it, it locks the state of the, fed of the cell in a given fate. And so typically, the example of the master selector gene so would be, for instance, so there is a gene called MyoD. Just, just, to, you know, just to give you a, a picture, MyoD, it's a master selector gene that is equivalent to muscle cell. So the point here is that the muscle cells are, no, they are differentiated cells. They're locked into this fate, and they're locked into this fate if and only if they express MyoD. So if you overexpress MyoD in the cell, in any given cell, it's going to be transformed into a muscle cell. And then, and then conversely, if you look at all muscle cells, they're going to express MyoD. Okay? Yes? Active, active state and off state. Yeah, active state and off state. So it means that, okay. So let, let's, let's, consider a let's consider a differentiated cell in your body. So you have, let's, you have two categories, you know, let, let, compare, you know, with respect to MyOD, you have two categories of cell. Some cell express MyOD, some cell do not express MyOD. So claim is that a cell is a muscle cell if and only if it expresses MyOD, okay? So now, give, re, re, you know, relative to the MyOD expression, gene expression, so MyOD gene expression can exist in two states. It can be an active state, where it's expressed and sustained and it's a muscle cell, and it's an active state where it's not expressed and it's not a muscle cell. That's what I mean. Of course, all your cells are differentiated, so that means that all the cells, I mean, not all the cells are differentiated. I, I take that back, you have stem cells in your body, but, you know, differentiated cells in your body, they might express other selector genes that are specific to a given fate. Okay? So MyOD is an example. Uh, in, this re in this review by Oliver Albert, uh, there is a very nice list of uh, selector genes, and what is really what is really cool is that they identify not only the gene but also the DNA sequence upstream of the promoters that are associated to this gene. So, 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 so uh, it's it's really an ensemble, both the genes, the proteins, and the DNA sequence that is specific and activated by uh, by this by this gene. So, I mean, these are just names, but another example of selector genes. I, I don't know them by heart. So I'm going to check. But for instance, uh, there is what are called the ASE neurons in C. elegans. And they are associated to the gene called uh, Key1. So you have a list of genes like that, and these genes are specific to things. And there are examples, uh, biologically relevant examples of this notion of genes that are self-activating and locking into a given serial fate. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, how long do I have? I have 20 minutes or so? 20 minutes, okay. So uh, I'm going to wrap up for the self-activating gene. I want to tell you a word about now the self-repressing gene. And so, uh, as you know, it's kind of opening, you might wonder what happens if I do a stochastic version of that, because you've seen what happens in stochastic, stochastic thing. And so if you do a stochastic version of that, you might switch between the on and the off state. You might be in trouble not being locked in, uh, in a state. And so uh, there are solutions to that but I don't have time to, to tell you about this, but you, this is a problem that you might have. Um, especially if you want to define, you don't want your muscle cell to suddenly become a neuron. That would be very bad. So you need to have a way to lock up later on this fate. Okay, so now let's move to the self-repressing self self gene. And so... Um, I need to... So now let's assume that X is repressing itself. And so dx over dt, now the only difference is that I'm repressing this by x0 and not by x. And so now if I look at my little diagram here, Okay. 
So this is, uh, so my production rate is going to look like that. Okay. And then my degradation is looking like this. So uh, at least now in this case, it's pretty simple. I only have one state. I only have one steady state. So I cannot have bistability in this model. So now what, what, would that, what could that be used for? So I'm going to mention two, import, two interesting properties of the self-repressing gene. And I'm going to focus on the second one because I think it's more interesting and more relevant for what we do uh, in the next couple of days. But I'm, I'm going to mention the two functions anyway. So the first function, first possible function, or I should say, yeah, I should not use function. First possible dynamics. Uh, so, uh, yeah, actually, why why is it why is it interesting to look at the dynamics? Clearly, the steady state is kind of trivial. The steady state, there is nothing really specific. The fact of having a negative feedback does not change anything. If I just had a flat rate, it would be you know there's nothing special here about having a repressing gene, but it's, a, it's the dynamics that the self-repressing gene is interesting. And so uh, the first possible dynamics uh, is that, and so this is again work by Uri Allen, who showed very nicely on, in a very, very careful uh, theoretical and experimental work that the self-repression can speed up the response. So now the question is speed up with respect to what? What does that mean? Well, imagine I have two cases. I have a case where a gene is self-repressing or a gene that where you simply have constant production. So that is the, the reference case. Speed up of the response compared to single, compared to simple, simple uh, basal transcription. Transcription. So what is the claim? The claim is that now if you compare an, a differential equation, so let's be a bit more specific. So you could do dx over dt is equal to beta x0 to the power n over x to the power n plus x0 to the power n minus delta x versus a system where dx over dt is basically a constant rho uh, minus delta x. Okay, and so you assume that the steady state are the same. And the degression rate are the same, and delta are the same. Okay, and then you compare quickly one system which is the steady state versus the other. And it's quite simple to do analytically, actually, I mean, in, in, some, in, some, in some parameter regimes. Okay, so now let's do, do I have color here? Yeah, okay. So now imagine I initialize the system. So now it's, my axis is time, t, and I'm looking at x of t with an initial condition in zero. So for the second case, rho minus delta x, so you have a steady state that is rho over delta, and then you're going to get there, you know, you have simply have a kind of exponential relaxation, and obviously the typical time of relaxation, tau is equal to one over delta. Okay, so that's a standard exponential relaxation. But now what is interesting is that now if you adjust the parameter beta, so that this guy has the same steady state that this guy. Yes? It's self-repressing gene now. We, we, I am in the self-repressing re context. It's not self-activating, it's self-repressing. So I should make it explicit, self-repression now. Still self-regulation, but now you repress yourself instead of activating yourself. Okay, so this is this equation here. The equation describing the dynamics is written here. So you see, you have a production rate, which is a decreasing function of x. Okay, 
right before it was an increasing function of x. The difference with before is that here it's x0 instead of x. So it means that you have a decreasing production rate as a function of x. This is what is drawn here. Okay. So we, we change this, we change the case. We're doing self-repression. So now if you look at the dynamics of the system, you get something. So if you assume that the steady state should be the same, for this case, you get something like that. You get a faster convergence. So this is a self-repressing gene. Okay, you get a faster convergence. And uh, the reason why you get intuitively, I mean, a very, in a hand wavy way, the reason why you have a faster convergence is because essentially you can basically get a much bigger beta here compared to rho since later on you're going to, be to break. It's like, it's like, you know, either you're going at, uh, you know, imagine you're driving a car. Uh, you know, if you want to go to the next turn, you can go at, uh, at, uh, at, you know, constant speed. So the constant speed would be this guy here. But when you can do that, you can accelerate in the beginning and then break much later on to, to, to do it in the, you know, to, to do the, to do, to do the, the travel. And this is what is happening here. The thing yourself, it's a bit like a break. So since you can break later on due to the self repression, you can accelerate in the beginning, and so you will reach the destination with a, with a, you know, essentially with a, with a, with a much faster time scale. So that's the idea. And so um, you can really show, you can do show that analytically. I, I don't want to do it because it's, uh, you know, for the sake of time, uh, I think it's, uh, and it's not, it's not, I think it's not, it's interesting, but it's not that interesting compared to what I'm going to tell you now, actually. Uh, so that's why I don't want to spend too much time on that. But believe me, you can show that this is ac you know, essentially ac accelerating convergence towards it. Okay. Uh, and I can give you, uh, if, you if you want, I can show you again analytically with, with a simple calculation. It's not very difficult to do. Uh, the more interesting case I want to do is uh, something related to biochemistry where uh, and related to some question you asked me. So uh, clearly, you know, this is, uh, you know, this system, this is it. You know, there is not much more to say about that. But to get more, a more interesting dynamics, we're going to assume to need to add an assumption to the self-regulating gene self-repression. So uh, you know, what is happening in the real cell? So imagine I'm going to have, you know, I, I express, I regulate this gene X. So what will happen is that the gene X is going to be transcribed into RNA. The RNA is going to, it will, it will go into the cytoplasm. Cytopl in the cytoplasm, it will be translated. Then protein X will take some time to be expressed. And so it's going to, you know, all of this takes time. All of this takes time. And then at some point, it's going to come back into the uh, cytoplasm, uh, the nucleus, and so if it represses the expression of gen X, it's going to repress, but it's going to repress it with a delay. There will be a delay between the time it's expressed and the time it comes back to repress itself. And so what is really interesting in the self repressing gene is to account for this delay and see what happens when you put a delay. And so instead of looking at the simple equation, which is essentially assuming this equation is mass action low, well mixed, and somehow it's, everything is diffusing instantaneously. But now let's put back some kind of temporal or spatial dependency. Let's assume that the production rate of x at times t does not depend directly on x, but rather depend on what was the state of x you know, in the past with a delay, say, uh, t. So now let's look at this system. So this is self-repression, but with delay. So self-repression with delay. Okay, and so now why is this system is in, a, a very interesting? Is because, I, I, because the fact that you had a delay is going to add, add a new time scale to the system. And this new time scale can create many, many interesting things, such as an oscillatory behavior. And so now let's, let's, let's talk about this. Let's see how you can get an oscillatory behavior. So my claim, 
So if the repression is strong enough, strong enough, if delay is big enough, is long enough, then you can get an oscillator. So again, this is like the similar as the previous case. It's related to dynamics, but it gives you a much more complicated and interesting dynamics. So now let's see why you can get an oscillator. It's actually crazy. Let's see. Let's see. I, I, I assume. Okay. Let, let, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So, okay, so this function here, so I told you, you know, a, a typical repressing function will look like a hill function like this, okay? Okay, so now for a system like this, so now an interesting aspect of the hill function, I look at what happens if n goes to infinity. Let's take the limit n goes to infinity in a system like this. So if n goes to infinity, uh, there are two behaviors that can happen. Depends on, are you below or above x0? So let's, uh, let's start with the case where you below x0. If you'd say n goes to infinity, so if you're below x0, this guy is negligible in front of this guy, and now you have x0 to the power n, x0 to the power n on the numerator, so you basically get beta. So if the limit when n goes to infinity, Essentially, until x0, the repression is just a straight line beta. Okay? Now, if you're above x0, uh, if you're above x0, so x to the power n now is bigger than x0 to the power n, so this guy completely draft, draft is this guy here, so you get x to the power n, and x0 over x to the power n, x is bigger than x0, so this guy is essentially 0. So, so hill function that we add in the limit when n goes to infinity, now it looks like a step function. It's giving you step function. So it means now your equation is becoming very, very simple. You know, now look, let's look at this equation. So now if you take strong enough, which means n goes to infinity here, this is what I mean by n goes to infinity, of course you can make a more continuous approach and study exactly at which n is going, what I described is going to happen, but for the sake of simplicity and explanation, I'm assuming I take n goes to infinity to see, to really see the phenomenon. So now dx over dt, now it's really simple. There are two cases. So if I am, if x of t minus t big T is lower than x0, this is beta minus delta x. And now this is if x of t minus t is smaller than x0. Sorry, yes, that's okay. And now this is simply equal to minus delta x if x of t minus t is bigger than x0. So now I get a very simple linear system, uh, but, the, but the, it's not, you know, you know at the given time it's linear, but then I'm changing the linear system based on the past history of x. And so now let's see, this system here can give you a nice oscillation, so let's, let's, let's see exactly what happens now. And to do that, I'm going to assume that I'm, you know, let's see what happens. Why do we have oscillations? So now let's look at the system. Now I'm looking back at as a function of time. And now I'm looking at the evolution of x of t. Okay? And then let's assume that uh, at, t, at t equals 0, you're exactly at x0. So let's, and then you're going, let, yeah, let's do that. How do I do that? Yeah, let's, well, let, let's give ourselves a t. And let's assume at t minus t, you are exactly at x is equal to x0. Okay? 
Okay, so now and let's assume that you are going up. Let's give ourselves a trajectory like this. Now let's look at what happens at t here. So at t here, you look at what was x, uh, what at x at t minus t. And so now at t minus t, x is becoming higher than x zero. You see, because uh, you know, at t minus t, x is getting above the threshold. So it means that from here, you are in the second situation. You degrade x. And so now you're going to degrade x in this region. OK? So now here, this is because x of t minus t is smaller than x0. Uh, sorry, bigger than x0. OK? And so this is true until, again, you reach x0 here. So it's a new time. And now this is going to happen, you know, if this is my t. So the, the dynamics of the system is changing again when I am t after this time. OK? So now I'm here. So now I'm here. Now at t minus t, x is going from above x0 to below x0. So it means that the dynamics of the system suddenly is becoming like this. It's becoming beta minus delta x. And so now from that point here on, I'm starting to go up again. And so here I have x of t minus t, which is higher, lower than x0. Okay. And so, of course, so you see how we do an oscillation because then now we reach x0 again. And then these guys go on back and forth between above and below x0. And so this is how you generate very easily an oscillation with a self-repressing gene with delay. Okay. And so, of course, there are many things you can do. For instance, you can easily calculate the period of the oscillator, like with this consideration. You know, you just match you know, you just compute, you can just by, you know, self-consistent approximation exactly compute this concentration and that concentration. Since it's a linear system, you know exactly what the equations of the system are between these two, uh, these two, these two concentrations, and you can compute the, 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 uh, the, um, the period. I'm just going to wrap up by writing what the period is. It's a good exercise for you to calculate if you want. Um, and so, Writing down what the expression is, you will find that. I mean, I, I write, I'm going to write the expression because it's it's not completely uninteresting. Otherwise, I will not do it. So you will find that the period. So the period. Let's call it uh, uh, period of the oscillation. Let's call that TP. So it's going to be equal to twice the delay, plus kappa over delta, plus something in the limit of delta big. Okay, so it's a Taylor expansion in power of one over delta. And then this k here is going to be equal to log r square over r minus one, with r is equal to beta uh, over x zero delta. And r should be higher than one to have oscillation. And so this r bigger than one simply means that this concentration here should be higher than x zero. This is a, this is a, this is the uh, the condition that is uh, that is expressed here. So you can do the calculation. And so what is interesting to see in terms of biology is that the field of the oscillation is essentially so if delta is small, it's basically twice the delay. So if you have a delayed network. You know, if you know what is the delay is for, you know, transcription, translation, translocation into the nucleus, you can estimate the period of a negative feedback oscillator. And this will be relevant for uh, our future lectures tomorrow, in the next days. So I'm going to wrap now. Thank you. Oh, yeah, one question, sorry. I had many questions, so I assume that. Yes. Um, so it's it's very interesting the way you introduce the oscillations in the system. Yeah. Now, is this true? You know, have you measured n? Um, I mean, the assumption of n going to infinity is, of course, impossible. How does these oscillations look 
when n so, is much more realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it works even with n low. It's just to give you a sense, to give you an intuition of what is happening, I take the n very, very big, and this, is this allows you to make calculations. But it works for n small. Then to do that, you, must, you have to do a bit more sophisticated calculation than what I've done on the blackboard. Uh, I can tell you more offline, but, but you can take a, a n realistic and get dissociation. And in biology, uh, we'll discuss biological examples later, like uh, tomorrow or the day after. Okay. <laughs>